4, we're back in John 4, and uh, so I guess we got to catch ourselves up a little bit in, in our mind's eye. Well, we just finished one of the most amazing moments in the history of Jesus' ministry, because for the very first time in Jesus' ministry, for the very first time in Jesus' life, in fact, he revealed himself. We called it the big reveal. He revealed himself as the Christ, the Christ. And uh, as we said uh, in all of those four sermons, you'll never believe who was first to find out. You wouldn't believe it. Nobody would guess it. Nobody would guess that it was an adulterous Samaritan woman at a well in Sychar. But it was. And we called that sermon series the, the big reveal because Jesus left the Jews. He left Jerusalem. He left the place that you would have expected him to stay and reveal himself as the Christ. And why did he do it? Why did he go to Samaria to reveal himself as the Christ for the very first time in his ministry? Because Jesus wanted to show that the gospel, the living water, is for the whole world. Now, that shouldn't surprise us because he had just gotten done telling that to Nicodemus. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And Jesus proved in going to this Samaritan woman at the well that John 3.16 wasn't just for the Nicodemuses of the world. It was for the adulterous Samaritan women too. And so he went to her first. He went to her first. And as he was teaching this woman, he, he taught her that the time has come to do away with Mount Zion and to do away with Mount Gerizim. See, the Jews worshipped in Mount Zion. They worshipped at Jerusalem. That was their local center of worship, the temple. And the Samaritans, they had their temple at Mount Gerizim, and that was their place of worship. And Jesus taught this woman that a time has come, a new dispensation has arrived, a new time in the life of God's people where there's no more temples, no more physical structures, no more geographic locations, but instead we will offer spiritual worship. Now we can see that here this morning. We're in a gym. We're in a gymnasium. It doesn't matter where we are geographically. It doesn't matter what building we're in. We don't meet in, we don't meet in temples. We sing today that we're living stones, the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so a new time has arrived. It, we, Jesus is really announcing what will be the inauguration of the church in just a few short years at the conclusion of his ministry. And he's fulfilling Old Testament prophecy of the coming of the Holy Spirit so that we can worship in spirit because the Holy Spirit has indwelt us. Now, up until this point in the story, there's only been two characters in our story. Jesus and the woman at the well. Just two characters. And that was intentional on Jesus' part. Because this revelation that he was the Christ, it wasn't for anybody else. It wasn't for anybody else except that woman. And we, we talked about in, in one of those sermons why that is. Why is it that Jesus would only reveal himself to this woman first? Well, we learn why in the book of 1 Corinthians. We're taught that God chooses the weak things of the world. God chooses the things that are despised to confound the wise, to confound the mighty, to confound the powerful, so that no flesh can glory in his presence. It is of grace. God gave his son to finish the work that we couldn't finish. But the first part of the woman at the well story spoke to the purpose of the book of John, right? What was it? The big reveal. Isn't that the whole purpose of this gospel? The big reveal? That you might believe that Jesus is the Christ the Son of God, and that by believing you might have life through his name. And so Jesus just revealed himself as the Christ, the whole purpose of the Gospel of John. But today, we're going to get more characters into our story. The woman has actually left the well. She's gone back to the townspeople to frantically tell them that somebody's out at that well who just told her everything she's ever done. We know that they're going to show up in a little while. Not in our sermon today, but in our next one. But now Jesus is left with some different characters. 
in their character. Just Jesus and his disciples. And he's not going to teach them that he's the Christ. And he isn't going to teach them about the purpose of John. Jesus today is going to teach them what they're supposed to do about it. What are you supposed to do about the fact that I'm the Christ? How is it supposed to affect us? How is that supposed to change our lives? Now, as we get into the text this morning, you've got to know that the disciples don't have the backdrop we do, okay? These disciples didn't sit at gospel fellowship for those four sermons and listen to the big reveal. They didn't know any of the conversation that took place with the woman at the well. In their minds, they're still going to the worship center in Jerusalem. They don't know about the spiritual worship. Jesus hasn't said that he's the Christ. They don't know where the woman went. She just took off. They don't know who's about to show up. They don't know about the unbelievable transformation that's about to take place in this town of Sychar in Samaria. And so we have this big reveal backdrop from our past four sermons the disciples don't have. But I'm going to tell you, the fact that Jesus' disciples don't have any of the background of his conversation with the woman at the well is going to work really well in his favor in his conversation with the disciples this morning because he is going to tee up a metaphor. We're going to see it. Jesus is going to tee up a metaphor that is forever going to be embedded in the disciples' minds. Now, the metaphor is born out of a problem that the disciples have. They have a problem. Frankly, I'll let you in on a little secret. It's a problem that we all have. It's a problem that we all have. And the metaphor that he's going to brilliantly paint for them and thus for us might just be the reason that they went out and in Acts 17 were accused of turning the world upside down. And I hope that this morning as we look at the disciples and we see their problem and we see Jesus' metaphor, that we look at us. Because we're disciples, right? We're disciples too, right? And so as we hear the Christ speak, I want us to understand what consumes him. What drives him? What satisfies him? And can we make sure that when we leave these doors this morning, that whatever it is that satisfies Jesus, that consumes Jesus, that drives Jesus, that it consumes us too? The title of the sermon this morning is Secret Food. Seasoned fields, but still four months. Would you look with me, please, at verse 31 of John chapter 4. Meanwhile, the disciples were urging him, saying, Rabbi, eat. Have you ever been really hungry? I mean, really hungry. We, if we started telling stories right now, passed a microphone around, some, somebody would tell a story about a time they were really hungry and then invariably somebody else would go next and they would tell a story about when they were even hungrier and the person that that really has the best story would just wait until last and it would just be the mic drop right nobody wants to go after that person because we all one up them on how hungry we were but we've all been hungry right i mean have any of you shopped hungry i've shopped hungry it's a really bad idea for me to shop hungry i come home with a whole lot more things than i need probably things that aren't good for me uh, some of us have, have tried uh, going hungry to lose weight, and, and you know, you, you, it, that can be a little dangerous <laughs> because you can actually kind of start getting dizzy, and you're just, you're really trying to lose weight, and you're trying to get a good head start on it, and, and it's hard to do it over a little bit over a long period of time, so we just kind of go for it, and then we're, we're dizzy and we're hungry. Or some of us have been on long hikes, and we didn't bring enough food, and, and you maybe had one granola bar. And, and you didn't really eat breakfast and you had a lot of coffee, so you're dehydrated and, and you're out on this hike and the whole way back, all you can think about is eating something, right? Or maybe you ran out the door in the morning, you, you missed breakfast. You had to get to work, you, wor you woke up late and you're sitting there just dragging through the day. Maybe even you didn't pack your lunch and so you're, you're just really waiting to get home from work so you can finally eat something. 
Now, I'll say that all of these are first world problem problems with hunger, okay? None of us really know what it's like to, to truly go hungry for our entire lives as they do in, in some other countries. But we, we know what it means to be really hungry. Well, that's the backdrop for verse 31. Why had Jesus been alone at the well in the first place? Do you recall? It's just a few verses earlier. Jesus had been alone at the well because the disciples had left him. And where had they gone? They had gone into town to buy food. That's where they had gone, to buy food. The whole point of the disciples' journey into the Samaritan town of Sychar was they were hungry. They had been on a long journey from Jerusalem up to Galilee, and they had stopped in this little town of Sychar. They were hungry and thirsty. Jesus, really hungry and thirsty. He stayed at the well. Obviously, that was the divine appointment. And the disciples went on ahead to Sychar to get food. Now, Jesus must have been famished. I'm talking really hungry. Like, it's possible he hadn't eaten for those two days that it took to get from Jerusalem to Sychar. It's possible. And here's what I want you to think about. You remember how the woman at the well left her water jar at the well? There's no indication that Jesus had even had anything to drink yet. Now, he asked the woman at the well, give me a drink. And then she kind of comes back and retorts at him. And then they go through this conversation. And that's when Jesus gets into the spiritual worship and teaching and telling her everything she ever did. And the disciples come walking up as soon as he said, I'm the Christ. And she runs off to the city to tell all of those people everything that, that, that there's a man there who told her everything she had ever done. And, and now here the disciples are. There's no indication Jesus had had anything yet to eat or drink. So he's hungry. He's thirsty. And so now, does it make sense why in verse 31, they're urging him? Because, I mean, they show back up at the well. They start passing out the sandwiches. And Jesus would just go take one. But why do they have to urge him to eat? Because he's not eating. He's not eating. They all sat down and immediately started tearing into the bread and whatever else they had, the vegetables. And Jesus is just sitting there at the well. I mean, at least that's what I picture in my mind. Why else are they urging him, Rabbi, eat? It's like a command. I mean, they've got to be feeling bad that he's the only one sitting there not eating. And that's the action that tees us up for the metaphor that's about to come next. Jesus just sitting there in the heat of the day, around noontime, hungry, thirsty, and tired, famished. His disciples are eating, and he's just sitting there. And this is what tees us up for the metaphor that he's about to give, verse 32. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him something to eat? Now, okay, we have the backdrop. We have the backdrop of the woman at the well. And so we see when we read verse 32 that this is clearly a metaphor. What's a metaphor? What's a metaphor? It's just a comparison. So he's not actually talking about bread and soup. But it's something that he's comparing to bread and soup. Whatever food Jesus is talking about symbolizes bread and soup. That's a metaphor. It's just a comparison. And so he mentions something that seems physical or something that we can associate that in our minds it's physical. But it's really to point to a spiritual truth. A metaphor. The disciples didn't get that though, did they? They took him literally. Somehow... Jesus had bread and soup sitting around that well somewhere. <laughs> They're checking under the water jar and looking down in the well. Where does he have his food? And so the disciples fell for it. They fell for it. Now, doesn't this bring up an interesting question? Have you, have you thought about this before? 
Why would Jesus so often use metaphors to trick people into thinking he meant something physical? Something material, something worldly. When he was really talking about something metaphysical, something abstract, something spiritual. Like, why doesn't Jesus just tell them the spiritual truth? And not use confusing metaphors to get to the spiritual truth. So think about it. Remember with Nicodemus, what did he say? You must be born again. And Nicodemus fell for it. How, how, how can I enter into my mother's womb and, and come out a second time when I'm old? There's Jesus using a metaphor that, that, that somebody fell for. What about the Samaritan woman herself with the living water? Remember what she says? Give me this water. Sh show me where it is so that I don't have to come to this well and draw water all the time. Now his disciples with the food. But then even later in John, he talks about the bread of life. I'm the bread of life. You know what his disciples say to that? Give us this bread always. Give us this bread always. They always take it literally. So why does Jesus do it? Well, why does he, he trick them into believing that he's talking about something physical rather than just revealing that he's talking about something meta metaphysical? Here's why, okay? It's to drive the point home. It's to drive the point home. To make an indelible impression on their minds. To make a lasting impression on their minds. See, metaphors bring spiritual realities into human terms. We have sayings like this. We say terms like, walk with God, right? Walk with God. The first time I used that with with uh, Eden and David, I don't remember which one of them said, said to me, what does that mean, Daddy? <laughs> I said, we just, we, we want to walk with God. Or I was praying, and I, I said, I pray that they would walk with, walk with God. And what does that mean, walk with God? I mean, they're, they're picturing this, this physical reality that, that they can't do in their minds, right? Just like, just like the disciples here are, are picturing, oh, Jesus has that food somewhere around the well. By the way, have you ever tried to explain that concept to a kid? Walk with God. It was a little bit more challenging than I thought. In case you ever run into it, it means we, we walk where he walks or, or we go where he goes. Okay, we're right alongside him. Um, it means we obey him. We, we stay by his side. Um, we, we have other expressions like, oh, they're just blowing smoke. They're just blowing smoke. And that just means they're, they're bellowing about themselves and exaggerating about themselves and we know it's it's uh you know they're just being braggadocious and and it's not it's not really true they're exaggerating we have phrases like uh laughter is the best medicine medicine right so there again there's a there's a metaphor okay and we just we use that phrase because laughter makes you feel better just like taking a tylenol now, God communicates truths about himself through, through language, and he uses language. He uses our finite minds to communicate truths about himself. And so these metaphors, these physical realities that we see and do and use and practice every single day, they allow us to be able to grasp truths about God. Oh, I know what food is. I know what it means to walk with someone. I know what it means to blow smoke. I know what medicine is. And so we use metaphors so that we can grasp these metaphysical realities, spiritual realities. And so when the disciples suddenly realized just how off track they were in their thinking, do you think they ever forgot that? Because they're about to realize, oh, he's not talking about real food. And it's going to make an indelible impression on their mind. Now they have a comparison to truly understand the mind of God. See, the way Jesus thinks about doing God's work is the same way that we think about scarfing down food. Think about that. When you were really hungry and you finally got to eat, you went for it. I mean, you started eating and maybe you had two helpings or three helpings and you were going to get full as fast as you could. That's how Jesus thinks about doing the Father's will. That's the metaphor. And just like our food satisfies us, satiates us, so Jesus' food satisfies him. 
doing the will of the Father for Jesus satisfies him so much that he doesn't even need bread and soup. He can sit there at that well with his arms crossed in the heat of the day watching all the disciples eat, and he's fine. That's how much doing the will of God satisfies Jesus. But in any event, and I've kind of revealed it, but we do have a question to answer. And the question is, what is the food that Jesus is talking about? Because it's not physical food. We know it's a metaphor. He's not hiding food behind the well. So what is the secret food? Verse 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Jesus just revealed the metaphor and the disciples went, ah. Now they get it. His secret food is the Father's will. Jesus is satisfied. He's full when he's doing his Father's work. That's his nourishment. You ever hear that phrase, I'm in my element? If I, again, passed around a microphone and asked everyone to tell me, when are you in your element? You'd all have something different to explain. That phrase just means, I'm at my happiest when, or I'm in an environment where I feel the most at ease, where I get the most pleasure when. I'm in my, my element. Some people might say, and you've probably heard this, I am in my element when I am curled up on the couch on a rainy day inside, and, and maybe in the winter time, and I'm, I'm reading a good book. I'm in my element. For me, I'm in my element on a day trip with Allie and the kids. And that's when I'm in my element. We've, we've gone somewhere to go for a hike or to a lake, and, and we're all together as family, and, and I'm just, I'm in my element. Uh, another time I'm in my element is if I can go on a long, arduous hike. I'm talking long hike, but you're going up, 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 and you finally reach the apex. You reach that peak, and you have a spectacular view of God's creation. And when I get to that peak, I'm in my element. Some of you are, are thinking right now what your element is. All of you have an answer. You know what Jesus' element was? He was doing his Father's will. Jesus was in his element when he was doing his Father's will. It's all he longed for. It's what fulfilled and satiated him. 20 times in the Gospel of John, he said, him who sent me, him who sent me, him who sent me, him who sent me. Do you remember uh, Job's really good friend, Eliphaz? He had some good friends, didn't he? <laughs> Job's really good friend, Eliphaz, and there, there's Job sitting with boils on him and ashes, and his whole family's dead. All his livestock was gone. Houses are burned down. Everything you could imagine. Satan's just come in and psh, leveled it all. What does Eliphaz do? Good friend, eh? Job, you're wicked. <laughs> you're just going on and on about how wicked Job is. This is why this is happening to you. Because, because you're so wicked. In the next chapter, Job gets to respond. He was actually kind of nice to his friends. But when Eliphaz gets done, Job responds in Job 23, 12. He says this, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my portion of food. So much Job loved the word of God. More than my portion of food. Even when Jesus is teaching about being anxious in Matthew 6, you remember, and he's talking about the birds. They don't toil. The Father feeds them. He asks this question. Isn't life more than food? Isn't life more than food? What does he conclude with? This is the stuff the Gentiles seek after. But what should satisfy you? Seeking the kingdom of God. Seeking the kingdom of God. Jesus lived that. In fact, this goes all the way back. This teaching goes all the way back to Deuteronomy in chapter 8, verse 3. Listen to this. 
by the way, do you know why Israel got manna? Do you know why God sent manna to Israel? They were hungry. No. No. Why did God send manna to Israel? Deuteronomy 8, 3, listen. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. That's why God gave manna, to teach this very truth that Jesus is teaching in Sychar at the well, that my food is to do the will of my father. But see, this is what I mean when I say the disciples needed to learn what they were supposed to do about the purpose of John. How is it supposed to change them? Folks, how is, how is this passage supposed to change us this morning? Did, did we come in today to be changed? Did we come in today to be changed? This was totally characteristic of Jesus' life. John 6, 38. Jesus said this, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. John 14, 31. But I do as the Father has commanded me, so that the world may know that I love the Father. Friends, Jesus always did the Father's will. That's all he was doing. That's all he was ever caught doing. What's Jesus doing? The Father's will. He's at it again. He's doing the Father's will. Now in verse 34 there, you saw that Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. His work. If Jesus was sent to accomplish the Father's work, what was that work? Well, ultimately, ultimately, the work that he was sent to accomplish was on the cross. In John 17, 4, in the high priestly prayer, though, before he was crucified, he says that he has completed the work that the Father has sent him to do. So ultimately, the work that Jesus was sent to perform was the it is finished upon that cross. But there was a whole lot more work that he was sent to do throughout his ministry. We're going to find out what that work is. But here's the question I have for you. What work has God given you to accomplish? And is that our food? Jesus was more interested in the woman at the well than a drink of water. He was more interested in the townspeople than he was in lunch. In fact, throughout this whole passage, you got to see that there's no indication. We have one more sermon in, in this passage of the woman at the well, and there's no indication in the entire passage that Jesus ever drinks anything or eats anything. The whole time. But go back to the question, what is the Father's work? What is the Father's work that Jesus is sent to accomplish? And Jesus is about to answer that for the disciples in verse 35. Do you not say there are yet four months, then comes the harvest? Look, I tell you, lift up your eyes and see that the fields are white for harvest. Now, what we have here is a saying, a saying. We don't know exactly what it referred to. But this was an agrarian society. There were a lot of farmers. And so it must have been a well-known saying, there are yet four months and then comes harvest. And Jesus uses this well-known saying to describe how we are not supposed to treat the Father's work. How are we not supposed to treat the Father's work? There are yet four months and then comes harvest. Don't treat it like that. Don't treat it like four more months. We have all kinds of sayings, right? Time is money. That means you can use your time to make a buck. Or we have practice makes perfect. The more you practice, the better you get. Although that saying isn't really true because none of us can be perfect. I had a teacher in, in uh, high school that would never grade above a 99 out of 100. It was a, our art teacher. And it always used to bother me because I worked so hard on my art project. And she said, you can always do better at art. <laughs> really bothered me. <laughs> Practice does not make perfect. <laughs> we have the, phrase, the phrase, save it for a rainy day. Right? And store up for when we're really going to need something. But we have all, all these sayings. We could go on and on with sayings. 
But wherever this saying Jesus brought up came from, we know what it means. We know what it means. If it means what? You're putting something off. Putting it off till later. Now, we actually have modern phrases that correspond to this phrase, there are yet four months, then comes harvest. What do we say? We, we don't say, there are yet four months and then comes harvest. We say things like this. You're just kicking the can down the road. That's what we say. And that's easy to do, right? I know it works sometimes. I'll just move a calendar item a little bit farther out if I don't have time to, to work on it. You're just kicking the can down the road. It's, it's coming back at you. Another phrase we use is, oh, we've got plenty of time. <laughs> oh, there's, there's plenty of time. And then all of a sudden the day or the hour is upon us. And we're like, oh, yeah, we didn't have plenty of time. But that's what Jesus means. Don't say that. There are yet four months and then comes harvest. Don't say that. Don't have that mindset. But why? Why? Why can't we say that? Why, why can't we use that phrase? What are we not supposed to put off? What? are we not supposed to put off the harvest the harvest because the harvest isn't four months from now the harvest isn't four months from now the harvest is now it's now we can't kick that can down the road we can't do that later it's right now now this phrase from jesus it, it conveys a sense of urgency like, this is, this is an urgent thing that we need to grasp. It conveys a sense of urgency in two ways. One, don't put it off. But number two, the harvest is here, and there aren't enough laborers for it. There aren't enough laborers for it. That's why Matt, in Matthew 9, 37, Jesus said, Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Now in verse 34 here in John 4, Jesus said his food was to do the Father's will and accomplish his work. And I told you he would answer that later. What is God's will? That's Jesus' food. What is God's work that Jesus is sending him to accomplish? Folks, it's to gather food it's to gather food. I have food you don't know about. It's the harvest of believers. You remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well? The Father is seeking these worshipers. And Jesus went to Sychar at this well to seek this woman and to seek this whole town. And here they Verse 30 in John 4 actually said they were coming to him. They were coming to him. Could it be that when Jesus was speaking this sentence in verse 35 that he was literally looking at the entire town of Sychar walking up to the disciples? A Samaritan revival, the least likely, the least sought after. And Jesus tells his disciples, look, look up. Lift up your eyes. Don't you see the secret food coming down the hill? Don't you see the seas and fields? Don't say four more months. And so, you know, you get it. It's an obvious, it's an obvious application for us. I told you you would, you would see it. Okay? I told you you would see it. Are, are our eyes looking up at the fields? Do we sense that same urgency? I mean, in one sense, God's going to save who he's going to save. But are we just sitting back going, ah, God will save who he saves. It'll all work out. Or are we praying earnestly that the Lord would send laborers into his harvest? Are you one of those laborers? The answer is yes. All of us. Every single one of us. Are those laborers. It's harvest time, friend. And it's happy time. Verse 36. Already the one who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for eternal life so that the sower and reaper may rejoice together. Now, 
there's two actions in evangelism, right? There's the planting and there's the harvesting. The planting and the harvesting. The sower and the reaper. Both of those actions are vital. You can't have one without the other. But it's hard to be one of those. It's hard to be the sower and not the reaper. Why? Because you don't see the fruit. It's really hard. You kind of feel like maybe you're a failure. I've never led anyone to the Lord. I, I can't do it. I, I, I get tongue-tied. They don't want to listen to me. It's hard. And you can get discouraged and just stop. And it seems like God set it up so that there's this time gap between the word preached and the word received. It does. But we don't need to worry about where we're picking up in the farming cycle. It's our job to be the farmer. Just do the work. Just do the work. But not only is the harvest urgent, friends, people are getting saved. People are coming to Christ. It's happening now. And so get in there. Get in there and get your wages. What are your wages, by the way? Fruit for eternal life. That's what verse 36 tells us. I asked you during the song service, what, what can we take with us to heaven? Now, the easy answer might be nothing. I get that. But we can. We can take souls. Just souls. Only souls. And when we get to eternity, whether we're the sower or whether we're the reaper of those souls, what are we going to do? Exactly what verse 36 says, so that sower and reaper may rejoice together. We're going to rejoice. We're going to rejoice. Sower and the reaper and those who were harvested. All right, one last saying that Jesus wants to highlight, verse 37. For here the saying holds true, one sows and another reaps. Now again, we don't know where this saying comes from. Jesus used two sayings. One, there's, there's, don't say there's four months and then comes harvest. He said, that's a bad saying. Here's the second saying. He says, this is a good saying. This saying actually holds true, one sows and another reaps. Now Jesus might be going back to Job 31 verse 8 on this, where we read, then let me sow and another eat. Or perhaps as we've been going through the book of Ecclesiastes, where Solomon said that he saw a great evil that one man labors and toils for possessions, but then another person enjoys them. Either way, Jesus says that this saying is true. One sows and another reaps. Some people do a bunch of work and never get to see the fruit. Somebody else gets to see it. Now, in the case of the disciples, are they the ones who do all the work or the ones who get to reap the fruit? Verse 38. I sent you to reap I sent you to reap that for which you did not labor. Others have labored and you have entered in to their labor. So the disciples are the ones who get to reap what someone else sowed. Others labored for it. Now, Jesus could be referring to a lot of things here when he says others have labored for this. He could be referring to Moses and the prophets all of those years. Or he could be talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. Remember, the disciples are now riding on the coattails of John the Baptist. He went out, he started bringing people in, and then his disciples started going over to Jesus. Or Jesus could be talking about himself, right? Because what had Jesus just done? He had literally just sown a seed in the heart of the Samaritan woman. And the whole town was on its way out to meet Jesus. And the disciples would be reapers of something that they didn't sow. Either way. There was no time to lose. It's time to reap. All right. Now next time, we're going to stop there this morning, but next time we're going to see this whole town come to Jesus. And they are going to declare something pretty amazing. Okay? And so we'll wait for that. But until then, what's our point today? What's our point? It's this. Jesus was so consumed with doing his father's will that he gave up food, water, comfort, family, time, rest, and relaxation to do it. 
His goal was the salvation of the lost. And all I want to tell you this morning is that our food is the same thing. Our spiritual food is the exact same thing. We have an eternal opportunity to be harvesters of true worshipers in a harvest that we didn't even plant. And so I leave you with this. Don't kick the can down the road. Don't say four more months. Lift up our eyes. The fields are ready for harvest in our own backyard. And whether you get to be the sower or whether you get to be the reaper, let's all go gather some fruit for an eternal reward. And we will all be rejoicing in those souls for all of eternity. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity, even at all, to be sowers and reapers in your harvest. You've saved us. There was nothing we could do. We were lost, condemned, on our way to an eternity in hell. And yet in your great compassion and grace, you looked on us in our miserable condition and you pulled us out. And Father, I pray that even as we focus on evangelism this morning, the spread of the gospel to our friends and neighbors and co-workers and countrymen, that if there are any here this morning or listening or watching and they haven't placed their faith in Jesus for the salvation of their soul so that they might know the living water and the bread of life, that they would do that even right now this morning. God, would you keep us from cowardice, from lethargy, from kicking the can down the road? It's a hard thing to share the gospel because you told us we're going to be hated because they hated you. And yet, it's a work that's urgent. And so help us feel that sense of urgency. Give us opportunities and help us to take those opportunities and be obedient to you even when it's discouraging. But we do ask that you give us those moments of joy where we could see even a town, maybe the town of Abbotsford, come to you, just like this town of Sychar is about to. We pray these things in Christ's name.